This session is not a postmortem of Halo. We're not exactly sure how it got billed that way, uh, but we're sorry if that's what you were expecting. Just so nobody was disappointed, we came up with a really brief postmortem. If you can at all help it, don't be a launch title. That's our postmortem. <laughs> Uh, this session is targeted at uh, designers and AI programmers. It may also be useful to anyone who is stuck in level three and uh, needs insight in how to beat our AI. The first thing we're going to talk about is um, our initial design goals for Halo and how they changed over the course of the project with the feedback that we got. We're also going to talk uh, briefly about our implementation, including the technical technical constraints, and the important framework elements, um, and then how those affect the level creation process. At the end of the talk, we'll give a demonstration of our production tools and try to show how all the, all the ideas um, translated into the player experience. I'm afraid this is my first GDC. I didn't realize we were supposed to be vague and secretive, so we're going to get into a lot of specific detail and give you guys the... Uh, the run of this store and tell you how we did everything. Um, that said, our intention isn't for you to come away uh, completely understanding everything we touch on, uh, certainly not every part of the AI. We just hope you'll be able to pick out two or three ideas and apply them to what you're working on. There's a lot of material here. We need to move very fast. Um, so unless you're just looking for a quick clarification, please uh, hold your questions till the very end. Uh, the title of the talk is The Illusion of Intelligence. It's not the reality of intelligence. If you came here for tips on how to make the enemies in your game intelligent, we don't have any. That's really hard. <laughs> Ask the lion head, guys. It's really hard. <laughs> um, what we do have for you is tips on how to make your AI appear to be intelligent. Chris and I have lots of experience pretending to be intelligent. <laughs> what? Modern video gamers have expectations uh, that they have of the AI in their video games. They expect novel situations. If Pac-Man came out today, reviewers would say it had no replay value, that the ghost AI was repetitive and predictable, there's no exploration, there's no story, and the mission goals are always just eat everything. <laughs> One method of achieving these novel situations is through heavy scripting. Uh, Medal of Honor did this with a lot of success. The positive aspect of this method is that the game feels like a movie. The negative aspect is that it feels like a movie, not like a game. Players get the sense that everything is preordained. Um, this method is also time consuming and technically demanding on the level designers because <laughs> they have to essentially become programmers. Players also expect total interactivity. Uh, people are tired of the one man against the mindless evil horde game. They want every character to acknowledge them and interact with them. And they even want to be able to manipulate these other characters. A common method to accomplish this is the extended interface. Uh, Unreal Tournament uh, did this also very well. Uh, unfortunately, the player spends a lot of time managing, and the end result is a lot of people just ignore this option. The final thing that players expect is a significant challenge. Gamers have become a lot more sophisticated. Many of them have played games in your genre for years, and they want a challenge. And this is especially true of reviewers and early adopters who can make or break a game. Uh, so it's important to provide them with a challenge. Some games do this through omniscient and relentless enemies, like Quake 3. Unfortunately, this method feels a lot like bullying, because nobody wants to have a reflex competition with an electron. It requires precise tailoring to your uh, player's reflexes, which is difficult in a long solo campaign. And it also becomes a barrier to the mass gamer because they can't improve their talent level and there's no other way to achieve success. I just want to make sure you don't take uh, any of these examples as a criticism. Uh, I only chose games that I really like. I just wanted to give you a, a brief, briefly explain why we didn't choose any of these methods. So parts of the AI are clearly designed. These are things like mission objectives and scripting. 
Um, we're not going to talk about these parts. Parts of them are also code, like firing patterns and pathfinding, but we're not going to talk about those either. We're going to talk about where design and code overlap, which is combat behavior. Ideally, you want to borrow the intelligence of the designers to make the AI seem smart, but you also want to use the generalization of code to make the intelligence procedural because you can't ship a designer on a CD. In Halo, the designers were responsible for anything that had a three-minute scope. This means uh, any aspects of the AI that were established over a period of minutes rather than seconds. A couple of examples of the three-minute scope would be racial personalities. Um, our characters express themselves over a period of time. Uh, for exa example, the grunts are comical and cowardly. The elites are tough and aggressive. The racial personalities were, were in the context of the designer. The designers also provided the AI with a strategic purpose. These are the goals that motivate the AI's actions, and they're not represented in code anywhere. Things like securing the landing zone or protecting the flag. On the other side of the aisle, uh, the code responsibilities were anything that fell in the 30-second scope. Uh, this means anything that the player <laughs> experiences on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. These are things like making intelligence decisions. Um, this rock is good cover. This, rock, this tree is good cover. This enemy tank is not good cover. Um, this also includes instant reactions. Things like, this grenade is going to explode. I need to dive away from it. Or the player is aiming a rocket launcher at me. Maybe I should hide. Once we divided the responsibilities, uh, we started to lay out our AI plan, starting with the design goals. The first design goal was to make the AI intelligible to the player so that the player can understand what they're doing. Anything that the AI is doing that the player can't understand, it might as well not be there. On the individual level, this meant giving the AI limited capabilities. The player tends to assume that the capabilities he has are what the AI can do. So he assumes that the AI can see things that he can see, that the AI can know the things he can know, and that the AI can do the things he can do. For instance, the energy shields on the elite in our game recharge exactly in the same way as they do for the player. The converse is even more important, however. Um, the AI should not do things the player cannot do or know things the player cannot know. There are no psychic AI in Halo. Uh, there are no AI with perfect aim. This is, this is really important to establishing the kind of fair reciprocation that you, you want to have with a player. There are invisible AI, but we let the player try out the invisibility so he knows what the limitations of it are. This concept of limiting the AI's capabilities to the player's capabilities is only a guideline. In Halo, there are some AI that can jump higher than the player or run faster than the player, such as the Flood. But a good rule of thumb is if you can give your AI an ability the player doesn't have, as long as that ability is recognizable and the limits of that ability can be easily predicted. Another way to make the individual AI intelligible, excuse me, intelligible, is by giving them a transparent thought process. In other words, it should be obvious why the AI is doing what it's doing. One of the ways we choose to do this in Halo is to limit the AI to basic cause and effect decisions. Uh, we also gave them custom animations and dialogue for each decision. Uh, in general, it's best if these animations communicate what the decision is. But even if it cannot be communicated, it's important to at least alert the player that the AI has made some decision so that they can try to guess what it was. And the final way we uh, made the AI intelligible on an individual level was through racial personalities. In Halo, grunts are cowards. And all of their behavior derives from that. They hide when the player targets them, and they panic when an elite is killed. Uh, in Halo, the elites are very aggressive. They rarely hide unless the player hides, and they go berserk and charge when they take massive damage. This kind of stereotyping isn't good if you're writing uh, dialogue, for instance, but when you're talking about AI, it's very important to make the stereotypes as simple as possible so that they're intelligible. 
Establishing these racial personalities was helpful in two ways. Um, first, it made the design process much easier. It's easier to make a stereotype than a complex character, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and it also saves you from muddying the waters and creating confusing or conflicting behaviors. Racial personalities also help the player. Uh, they make the behaviors the player has seen easier to remember. Oh, that's the coward guy. He's going to run away. And it also makes them easier to identify and predict. That's the coward guy. I bet you if I throw a grenade at him, he's going to run away. Keep in mind that the player's first impressions are what establish these racial uh, personalities. Uh, if you remember back to the first time you meet an elite in Halo, you don't have a gun, and he jumps out from behind a door and starts shooting at you. Um, so we established that the, the elite is very aggressive and often quite scary. Um, whereas the first time you meet a grunt, you've got the grunt-killing pistol. Uh, it's the first time you actually get to wail on somebody, and he immediately tries to run away once you pop around the corner. To make our AI intelligible on a group level, uh, we try to give them strategic goals. Players are naively confident in your AI's, uh, AI programmer's abilities. They'll assume your AI knows that they are supposed to be protecting the tractor beam power switch until they prove that they're just standing around and not doing anything intelligent. In Halo, we worked hard to allow players to continue to believe that the AI, that the AI has strategic objectives. We mostly fake this as you can probably guess from the subject of our talk. But it gives the, enemy, it gives the player that the, the feeling that his enemies are opponents and not just obstacles that he has to overcome. We also gave, on the group level, our AI clear racial goals. Um, when you have a... Roles, excuse me. When you have a consistent racial role, you uh, give the player feedback on how a group of enemies is going to react. When you walk into a room and you see nothing but a bunch of grunts, you can figure that they're probably going to collapse easily and it's not going to be much of a battle. Whereas if you walk into a room and see a couple of elites backing up those same grunts, you know that you're in for a fight. The next design goal was to make the AI in Halo interactive. We know from experience that AI that doesn't react to the player is not fun. We've all played those games. Uh, so we assume that the more ways the AI reacts to the player, the more fun it will be. But we didn't just want to make them more efficient at combat. So we wanted to add lifelike reactions that made the AI more engaging. Uh, first, we wanted an AI that could be impressed. The player wants to be important. He, we create this entire game universe just to put him at the center of it. And part of being at the center of your own universe means you're the biggest badass in the room. In Halo, everyone has a reaction to seeing the player for the first time. The grunts are surprised and, and they run away in terror. Um, the elites usually see you as a, a, a threat and so they Im immediately start targeting you and making sure you can't get away. The Marines, on the other hand, are just impressed. They stare at you and they make comments like, wow, it's him, or I didn't think he'd be so tall. <laughs> Players really respond well to this because it makes them feel like they're the ones that are impressive. Uh, we also wanted an AI that could be fooled. The player wants to be a ninja. He wants to toy with his enemies and manipulate them and then humiliate them. Uh, unfortunately, psychics cannot be fooled, so an AI that relies on its eyes and ears was essential. We had to limit the AI's knowledge. Another defining ability of ninjas is being able to predict what their enemies will do. We help the player do this by giving the AI lots of simple cause and effect reactions. If I shoot over here, the enemy will investigate over here, and so I can ambush them. If I throw a grenade into a room, the enemy will run out of the room, so I can force them out of cover. The other way we help the player become a ninja uh, was by giving the AI very predictable strategies. Um, for instance, they have a they have a straightforward search pattern. Um, they move forward at a constant rate. They don't double back, and they aren't very good at watching for ambushes. So this allows the player to manipulate the AI into doing what he wants and eventually humiliating them. The final way we wanted to make the AI interactive was to allow it to be thwarted. 
Um, the player wants to be the commando. He wants to dominate his enemies, and uh, he wants them to know that he was the one that beat them. To accomplish this, we included the concept of a breaking point. Uh, for example, when the grunt sees enough of his, of his friends die, he runs in terror. And usually this happens with several grunts at the same time. Um, when an elite takes a large amount of damage, he just loses it and starts charging you. And that's how you know that you've won. This happens as a, at a, on the group level as well. Um, if an entire squad takes casualties, um, it will retreat to a defensive position. Um, the squad members will take cover longer and try to fight more defensively. And this tells the player that he's got the enemy on the ropes and that he is a commando. The final design goal that we had in Halo was we wanted to make our AI unpredictable. It's important to note that unpredictable does not mean random. Uh, we found that random factors in the behavior are rarely good. Uh, they cloud the issue. They make it very difficult for the player to figure out what's going on. For us, unpredictable, unpredictable means not repetitive. Uh, for reasons I've listed already, we wanted the AI to be predictable. Um, so that means the player is the only unpredictable element. Because we know the player is going to do slightly different things each time he plays. In Halo, we use this uh, to trigger a cascade effect. The unpredictable player puts the AI in unpredictable situations, uh, which causes unpredictable reactions. And this leads to a unique experience. This also causes a feedback loop, because the unique experience leads to more unpredictable player actions and goes through the cycle all over again. The final way that we avoided repetitive, repetitiveness uh, was the use of analog reactions. When you drive an encounter, which is what we call uh, a group of AIs, with a script, uh, they're very predictable because the inputs that the script takes are very digital. Is the player in the room or not? Is the AI dead or not? However, in Halo, the encounters are driven completely by code. It has a much higher resolution of inputs. Um, exactly how far away from the player is each actor, and can he see the player? Exactly how much health does the actor have left, and how far is he from cover? Uh, this allows small changes in the situation to be amplified by the AI to yield large changes in behavior. And now I'm going to let uh, Chris talk a little bit about the technical goals. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so Jamie's given you an overview of what the basic design goals are for Halo's AI. And now I'm going to talk about how those design goals we use to drive the technical design process on the AI. We didn't really have any specific technical goals we wanted to shoot for. There isn't really much in the way of specific cool technology set pieces in Halo. Mostly the technology we have on the AI side is just used to advance the design of the game and to focus on those goals that we talked about earlier. But there are constraints we have to live with because, of course, we don't have a perfect world and resources are not infinite. So this is basically uh, the situation that we're heading for. We want to try and simulate an epic battle. And in our game world, epic battle means probably about 20 or 25 characters. We call them actors, and they're the AI characters in the world. They're every non-player character. <coughs> Battles also feature vehicles in Halo, and usually they'll be between two and four vehicles in your average large-scale battle. And the goal is that we shouldn't consume all the resources we have some limited amount of CPU time available to us. Originally, we planned for about 10 to 20% of the CPU of the Xbox. And the Xbox is a Pentium 3 733 MHz CPU. Because we didn't have the final hardware available to us at the start, and we couldn't know exactly what the scope of the AI would be, that turned out to be roughly in the middle. So we use about 15% of the final game CPU. One of the big wrinkles in Halo is that we have to support a two-player cooperative <coughs> mode. This is one of the big design goals, and it's a really hard one to support from an AI point of view. Because it means that you can have two players who potentially are in completely different situations. They're activating twice as many AI, there's twice as much stuff going on, and you end up having twice the load on all components of the system. So we have to scale things down a little bit for each individual battle. And finally, there are some really specific design goals which we want to support. The AI has to be intelligible, interactive, and unpredictable. And uh, the way that we do this on the technical side is through there are three specific ways we go about handling each one of those challenges. In order to make the AI intelligible, we give them a very understandable, clear communication structure. 
In order to make the AI unpredictable, we use uh, emergent behavior techniques, which are built up out of very simple components that interact together in a cascade style fashion. And in order to make the AI interactive for the player, we have a really specific individual knowledge model. I'm going to talk about each of these three components in turn. So the goal is that the AI should be able to react to the player, and every individual AI should react to the player in an appropriate fashion for that specific actor. And the way we do this is we have a knowledge model which is stored inside every actor in the game. This is not a complete model of the world. For obvious reasons, the world in Halo is really large, very rich, and we can't model everything for every character in the world. So the way we do that is by um, ensuring that we only model objects which are relevant to combat. That turns out to be characters and vehicles and things like dangerous objects in the environment, grenades, weapon fire, and so on and so forth. And we, know, we model all of that on an individual basis, so every actor has their own perception of the world. This means that uh, if Jamie knows that I have a gun pointed at him, his friend who's around the corner almost certainly doesn't know that, unless Jamie has told him about it. And you can see this in action here. Um, there is a Marine who is searching for the last survivors of the Covenant outpost, and this happens to be a Covenant elite who's hiding behind some crates. Uh, excuse me, Covenant control panels. And... Uh, <laughs> You can see that the uh, Marine has got some information about where he last saw that particular character. That's the uh, blue debugging circle you can see there. That's his knowledge model. And there's a black line being drawn to the elite, which is his actual position. The Marine is not aware of the elite's actual position, but he does know where he last saw the guy, so he's going to go and check it out. And the way that we derive this individual knowledge model is through a real, physically plausible perception model. We uh, model four of the six senses. We model vision hearing, touch, and ESP. And we use ESP very, very sparingly, uh, only in situations where it's cinematically appropriate for the Covenant to know you're there and to come charging around the corner. And also, um, one of the things we found was really important is if you're trying to get coordination between a group of friendly characters, it's very important they should be able to maintain information about each other without necessarily being in each other's visual cones. If you have a group of Marines who are advancing in formation on some enemy position, they almost certainly will not be able to have everybody else in their field of view at once. But it's critical they should know where everybody is so they can coordinate well. So we use ESP on our friends quite extensively. And that's the only cheating we do. And this cheating doesn't take the form of allowing the AI to have access to the real state of the world. We're very careful we don't ever do that. Instead, what we do is that all knowledge is gated through the individual knowledge model. And the knowledge model is the only access the AI has to the state of the world except for things which are not relevant to combat, like doors and cedary objects, etc. So another thing that we have to do in order to keep the complexity of the system down is that memory has to be selective on a per-character basis. If we didn't do this, we run into order n squared problems, where you have 25 characters, all of them are fighting a battle on some open field, and every one of them has information about every other character that's out there. You quickly run into hundreds and hundreds of data structures and... Although it's very interesting to have potentially your knowledge of how the battle is working, humans don't work like that. We do not chunk data in that kind of fashion. We don't maintain individual knowledge about everybody. So the AI in Halo follows a one-too-many kind of counting system. We discard information about characters, even if we could potentially know exactly where they were, if they're a long way away, or if they're not doing something interesting. We try and keep the number of characters that we actually maintain information about down to a manageable level. And that level turns out to be about three for friends and about five for enemies. So every AI has some single-digit number of knowledge objects about characters in the world. You can exceed that limit at any time for any character if there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in their environment, though. And one of the really nice things about this is that because the AI has got information about its local state only, the decisions that they make are almost always based on local stuff that's happening around them. And that means that if the player is looking at an AI and the AI makes a decision, they can almost certainly see what the other object was the AI used to make that decision. So the AI isn't making decisions based on the fact that they can see someone who's 300 meters in the other direction behind the player. And finally, the upshot of all of this is basically that the AI has got a persistent knowledge state that the player can reason about in a fairly human understandable kind of fashion. They can fool the AI, they can trick it into doing things. Basically, the goal is to make the player feel like a space ninja commando. The second of the major design goals is that the AI needs to be intelligible. You can have the smartest AI in the world, but it will not matter one whit if the player doesn't know what the AI is doing and that it was really doing something terribly clever. Why didn't you see that? 
So the way we do this, we have to communicate the AI's intentions to the player. Because otherwise, the player is just going to see decisions happening and not understand what is going on. We found that the player derives a lot more fun if they can actually see the states that the AI is using to make the decision, because it's easier for the player to learn about what the AI is doing. And in fact, almost any hidden state that's inside the AI, which is influencing their decision making, can potentially turn out to be a source of annoyance for the player. So it's important that we try and keep the player informed as the AI's current mental state. There are three main techniques that we use to do this. We use language in the form of spoken dialogue. And this is not just dialogue in English for the Marines, for example, or for the grunts where the player has a translation software for them. This is uh, for every AI character in the game has some amount of speech that's attached to them. And uh, even the Flood, who don't really have vocal cords anymore, have got different kinds of muttering. And the reason that we do that is because tone of voice turns out to be very important in communicating the decisions that someone is making. If you hear the uh, elites, who don't sound anything like humans, really, they still have the same intonations because they basically reversed English speech. That's how we ended up doing that. The second of the two major tools is posture. When an AI has got some intention over time, for example, I'm sneaking up on this person, or I'm running away, or uh, I've been wounded so I'm limping, then we want to communicate that over time. And the way we do that is through the posture of the AI and their animation state. They can sneak, they can crouch, they can sprint, that sort of thing. And we also have animations which are not persistent over time, but which are one-shot animations, which I call gestures. You can see the Marine there is pointing at something. Who knows what he's pointing at, but... Uh, there is a certain number of limited gestural animations we use, and these aren't just gestures that are used for communication and combat, but also gestures that are attached to specific actions, like diving away from grenades, rolling in and out of cover, um, and other ones that I can't remember right now. And it's also important that this is not just used to communicate to the player what the AI's internal state is, but also what the AI thinks about what the player just did. If you can give feedback to the player using these same tools, then you've got a really, really powerful tool you can use to tell the player, this was a good action, you just did something really significant, or the AI is not paying attention to you, so you might as well try something else. So we make the, uh, we spend a lot of effort on specific dialogue and animations which are used for specific reactions the AI might have to a player's action. This turns out to be very important. It really makes the player feel like they're part of the game as opposed to just being a floating camera wandering around observing this big AI environment. And lastly, we want to make the AI a little bit unpredictable. We don't want it to be repetitive. So you can see here an example of a non-repetitive way of tackling this particular encounter, where uh, I've driven the uh, jeep off the cliff into the middle of the group of jackals who are searching. And if you'll notice what's happening here, a bunch of the jackals are just frozen in place and are staring at the jeep that's about to crush them, and one of their friends is diving off to the side. This is an example of survival of the fittest in Halo. <laughs> but... Uh, Basically, the way that this works is that we build the AI system just as a general principle up out of lots of simple components. And these simple components interact with each other in fairly simple ways, but the overall complexity of the system is caused by the number of different components and the number of different ways they can interact. And this happens on multiple levels in the uh, AI system. One way we originally thought about doing this was through using a fuzzy logic kind of analog emotion system to handle the way the AI worked. In fact, we had four emotions. We had fear anger, surprise, and defensiveness. And these emotions were used to control the AI's behavior, and they were all based on different inputs from the world. The only problem is that because they're analog variables, and there's four of them, they're all hidden from the player. It's very hard to try and express that much emotional state when characters are running around and jumping and firing weapons and that sort of thing. It's almost impossible to tell the player exactly what's happening. And in particular, the decisions the AI makes are based on analog decay rates and threshold values that really are wholly unobvious to the player. And the player can't build an effective mental picture of that, typically. So we mostly discarded that system. Instead, we use a lot of uh, cause and effect stimuli. Basically, a lot of the AI's decisions are made on a binary basis. This isn't to say that they just work based on true and false <coughs> input conditions. A lot of them take analog input, like how far away is the player, what is the, how is the player looking at me, and so on. But then we tend to quantize that information and then perform operations on the quantized data. And this leads to much more predictable results, we found. There are some examples of different things that we use there. But this isn't appropriate everywhere. There are still cases where you really want analog behavior from an AI. In 
often situations where players would be responding with analog behavior in the same circumstances. Like defensiveness is the one analog variable that we use a lot. And that's basically a measure of how threatened the AI feels by the current situation. As the defensiveness increases, the AI tends to take more and more defensive actions. It basically provides like a single linear axis that combat can follow at any given time. And the player can quite easily reason about this axis, like, I'm hiding behind the corner, therefore the AI are coming after me really fast, but if I jump around the corner and start shooting at them, they'll all like, get scared after a while and run away. Players are very good at making that kind of reasoning, we found. And one of the things that makes the immersion behavior approach really practical is the fact that Halo's got a rich world simulation to start with. We have vehicles and projectiles and weapons and scenery and all kinds of things that individually, the objects in the game are designed to interact well on their own as a self-contained unit, but to have nice, well-defined interactions with other things in the game as well. And we're continuously seeing situations that no one would ever anticipate. If any of you have been following what our fans have been doing on the internet, they've been blowing each other up in jeeps and <laughs> sending AI flying and all sorts of horrible things. But also in the single player example, you quite frequently will see, will see behavior that's a natural consequence of the way the world works. You could be standing somewhere with a glass floor between you and some enemies, and the enemies will just be circulating around and kind of staring up at you and waiting. But if you break the glass floor or someone shoots the glass, then maybe those enemies will decide they're going to jump at you now because that, way, that path is open to them. That's just one example of how there are two separate elements, the glass floor that can break and the enemies that know about the environment. And when you combine those, you get behavior where suddenly the player really realizes they have to protect this glass floor between them and the enemies. And one consequence of the fact we have this big emergent simulation is that we have to have flexible behavior. Whenever we do group coordination or that sort of thing, or uh, for example, scripted behavior sometimes, we don't want that behavior to be forced. If you're locking an AI into a particular action, the player will almost always notice that the standard reactions that they're expecting from the AI just don't work anymore. And the player believes that this makes it feel as though these particular AI are somehow different. They're being, script they're being scripted. They're not responding how the player has learned over the hours of gameplay. So whenever we do group coordination in Halo, it's always in the form of a request-based system where individual actors still have the freedom to choose whether or not they're going to obey that group behavior and whether they're going to instead dive away from the grenade that someone threw just right next to them or say hello to the player who just turned up. And uh, now Jamie's going to talk a little bit about how we implemented stuff. Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> uh, now we're going to move on from theory and talk about our implementation. In keeping with the theme of our talk, I'll start by explaining how we divide the responsibilities between design and code during our implementation. Uh, the designers focused on the flow of battle. Here you can see uh, a wave of Marines who are charging a defensive line of Covenant. Uh, we'll talk about these little squares later, but for now it's important that you notice that uh, the Covenant are all grouped together behind their defenses, and the Marines are charging them in a pretty coherent line. On the technical side, uh, the programmers worked on uh, small scale, uh, scale reactions and responses to the individual actors. Here you see the Marines uh, selecting targets to fire on. They're determining which targets they can see and which targets are in cover. One of the main areas we focused on uh, was using the difficulty level to make our AI seem more intelligent. It should be obvious that in most cases, smart a smarter AI equals tougher AI. But what we found from our playtests was that the reverse is also true. Tougher AI is perceived as being smarter AI. The tougher you make the enemies, the smarter they seem to the player. In one playtest, we had weak enemies. Um, they died easily. They didn't do a lot of damage. 36% uh, of the players thought that the game was too easy. And that uh, led to the result that only 8% of the players thought the AI were very intelligent. In the next playtest, uh, we increased the hit points of the enemies and increased the damage they dealt. And 0% of the players thought the game was too easy, which translated to 43% of them thinking that the AI was very intelligent. <laughs> um, our playtest guys tell us that 43% is a good rating. Uh, apparently, people are reluctant, reluctant to admit that the computer is smarter than them. Another way we use difficulty level to improve the AI was by providing a consistent challenge. Uh, if the game goes from easy to hard and back again, 
Players attribute the easy parts to poor AI and the hard parts to evil level designers. So by keeping the difficulty level consistent, we were able to avoid these pitfalls. I'm going to talk really quickly about negative reinforcement um, so we don't go too much over. <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to kill the player. As long as he can tell how he messed up and how to change his tactics, um, he's going to accept it. So one of the ways that we helped um, the player figure out uh, what was a bad tactic without killing him was we added the recharging shield to Halo. Uh, it allowed the player to take temporary damage and then retreat and essentially return to full health. This way we, we could show him that he was using uh, the wrong tactic without killing him outright. Another uh, tactic that we discouraged um, was the melee attack rush. Uh, our AI is not very good at shooting someone if they're at very short range. Um, so to discourage the player from getting that close to the AI, we gave some of them very powerful melee attacks. Um, the elite tends to beat the hell out of you if you get too close to him. <laughs> you can go too far and make the game uh, difficult if you don't reward the experimentation and you only concentrate on negative reinforcement. Um, but playtesting can help tune that. Uh, the second uh, implementation um, that uh, we tried to achieve was using uh, battle lines. These are imaginary lines that determine where one side of a conflict is separated from the other side. To do this, we focused on making strategic spaces. It's very important to make spaces that highlight the strength of your AI. A battle in a corridor does not have a lot of strategy involved, and so there's no intelligent things for the AI to do. When you have a more interconnected space, um, it allows the AI to flank the player and surprise him, which makes the AI look more intelligent. And it also allows the player to flank the AI, uh, giving him a chance to watch the AI react to his tactics. Um, one weakness of interconnected spaces is that they tend to be chaotic. And so to uh, get over that handicap, we had to establish killing zones, which are uh, open areas with positions of good cover on both sides that tend to be death traps to anybody that gets caught in them. Flanking is still possible in, uh, in an area with a killing zone, but the battle is more directed and the battle lines will be more clearly defined. This also works very well when there's multiple enemies to fight. Uh, so you can, you can view the whole battle and tell that it's not just chaos. Um, the most important way we controlled the flow of battle, though, was through attacking and defending states. Each group of actors, uh, which we call encounters, has an aggressive territory that it wants to occupy. Um, it also has retreat conditions, uh, such as a number of casualties or the position of the player, which cause the encounter to um, transition into a defensive state, where the actors are... Uh, closer together and in a more defensible area. By c carefully collapsing an encounter from a large aggressive territory to a smaller defensive territory, we, we were able to cap capture the feeling of a dynamic battle that had an ebb and flow. I should mention that uh, our, our actual AI system got a lot more complicated than just the simple attacking defending states, especially if you overlapped a lot of them. Um, but in a large majority of our encounters, I'd say about 80% we didn't get any more complicated than just having two states. The final tool we used when we were implementing the design side of the AI was playtesting. Uh, for our playtests, we bring in between 25 and 35 non-hardcore game players who have never played the game before. Uh, we put them in a lab for an hour, and then we have them fill out a survey um, about their experience. We found that this gives uh, the most objective results and lets us act on the feedback with the confidence that it's accurate. Just as a brief aside, if you are not doing playtests, you should be doing playtests. And if you are doing playtests, you need to do more playtests uh, earlier in your development cycle. We actually have the designers watch the playtests. Uh, nothing forces you to confront reality faster than watching 30 people repeatedly die during your tutorial. <laughs> until they hate the level, they hate the designer of the level, and they hate the game. They just want to leave. Um, it turned out the desire to get people to stop wanting to quit during the tutorial was a major uh, motivation for our early design process. <laughs>
the most useful data we got from our playtest was a list of things to avoid. Uh, at the top of this list is subtlety. If it's not totally obvious, it's too subtle. Even if you make something as obvious as you can possibly make it, most of the people will miss it the first three times they see it. For example, uh, in Halo, the grunts run away when the elite is killed. Initially, nobody in our playtests noticed this, so we had to keep adding clues to make it more obvious. By the time we shipped the game, we had made it so not only does every single grunt run away every single time an elite is killed, they have an outrageously exaggerated panic run where they wave their hands above their head, <laughs> they scream in terror, and half the time one of them will say, leader dead, run away. <laughs> I would estimate that less than a third of our users made the connection. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, another thing we learned from our playtest was to avoid looking, uh, letting our AI look broken. When it comes to AI, most players are looking for any excuse to jump all over you for shipping a bug. Um, for example, in early versions of Halo, uh, the AI had this short pause between seeing you and recognize that, recognizing that you're an enemy. Um, this was to allow the player to get the jump on AI or retreat back around the corner if he wasn't ready to fight. But our playtest feedback uh, showed that players assumed that this was a bug, um, and they all said it made the AI look dumb. So we ended up almost completely removing this perception time from all the characters. Uh, because even though it was intentional, uh, people assumed uh, it was broken. And that's one of the things that playtests really help you determine. The other useful um, feedback that we got on things to avoid was insufficient challenge. Um, we talked about challenge being an important factor in how intelligent people assume your AI is. Um, but the playtest really gives you a lot of fine tuning um, to get the exact level where it's hard enough to be smart, but not so hard that it, it's frustrating. The other useful feedback that we got from our playtest was a clear idea of where exactly we could refine our AI. We can make sure that the thought processes we were trying to communicate uh, were, being, uh, were, were getting across. We learned uh, which of our animations were being interpreted correctly and which ones we needed to change or exaggerate to avoid being confusing. Um, one of the most important things we were able to refine because of our playtests was our engagement distance. Uh, nothing breaks our, our AI faster than engaging it from the wrong range. When you snipe the AI, it tends to look kind of oblivious to the danger it's in. Um, and when you get too close, it looks robotic and a little awkward and it's not very effective. So we were able to playtest extensively our weapon ranges um, and the activation ranges of the AI um, to keep the player at this optimal engagement range. Um, if you want to learn more about our playtesting, um, our playtest guys, Bill Fulton and Keith Sturry, did a talk a few days ago, which you can find in the proceedings. So now Chris is going to talk a little bit about the technical implementation. Right, and Jamie really does mean a little bit because I want to get to the demonstration. Okay, so uh, this is a simple block diagram of what our actors actually look like. You can see the world, and there's information flowing from the world down into the AI, and then from the AI back into the world. We tightly gate all of the information. It all flows through the perception system on input and the motion control system on the output. This is very important for letting the player understand what the AI is doing, because the player has got the ability to observe the AI's perception and to observe the AI's motion. And if there are any other invisible channels there, the player can't observe that. So uh, it's broken up into two sections. The left-hand side, you can see, is our knowledge model, where there's the information gathering phase that uh, takes memory from very raw form and then processes it over time in a layered form. So information goes from raw perceptual data to memory about objects, then into a processed information about the current situation the AI is in. And then that goes into the spatial analysis Section. Sorry, the spatial analysis comes first, and the spatial analysis feeds into information about the situation, the threat level, and then that affects the AI's emotions, their persistent state over time. Uh, this is a 
very complicated number crunching process, basically, because there are thousands and thousands of objects in the world and lots of AIs observing them. So it's very important to distribute this over time. And as long as you always have the most recent information at each one of these phases in the cycle, then your AI can reason from information that's probably delayed by between half a second and a second. And we generate discrete stimuli as we're doing this information processing phase. These stimuli are then passed off to the decision logic. And the decision logic takes the discrete stimuli that have happened over time, as well as the current situation and the current emotions of the AI. And it takes that into account. And uh, I'm going to elaborate on this in a second, but basically the, what the decision logic does is it picks from a finite number of actions that the AI could be taking at any given time. Only one action is ever active, and then action, sorry, that action is then what influences the motion control subsystem and determines exactly what the AI does. So this is the decision logic now expanded into another slide. Uh, there are two main components to the behavior of any given AI. Uh, the perception system feeds an alert cycle, which is basically the simple reptilian behavior of the AI. It's, uh, it's innate. It's like attack, oh sorry, see enemy, attack, pursue the enemy, and then go back to a relaxation state. And this is what drives the default transition between every individual action. Uh, the actions are also very, very simple themselves. They're things like flee, fight, charge, that sort of thing. And each one of these is... It's basically a finite state machine. There's a very small amount of information in the state in addition to which state we're in, though. Uh, it's just an information about what the current goal is and what the completion rules would be for that goal. And then there are very, very simple transitions, which are the default transitions between actions. But almost all default transitions are generated by the alert cycle as the combat proceeds. And uh, the other thing is that there's a big toolbox of behaviors. And this is layered on top of the default cycle. You can turn off all the behaviors, and the AI will still operate. It will just be very, very boring. Um, Doom-level AI, basically. And um, the behaviors are all activated and deactivated based on stimuli that come in from the world. Each of them is a little procedural chunk that's got information about when it's appropriate to perform this behavior. And there are various kinds of behaviors that can fire. They can do things like change the current action to be something else, very straightforward. They can override other behaviors. And they can persist over time and take control of the AI for a brief period as well. Things like throwing a grenade would be a good example. Um, and then these go into a little bit of a black box. This black box is custom code that is done according to the rules that we want for every individual race. It's uh, very, very simple. It basically just enables and disables behaviors that, or, that exist in the toolbox. So, for example, the grunts will flee very easily, but they never flee if there is an elite in their current situational knowledge. Just something very simple like that. It's typically a page of code for each individual racial character. And then this feeds into the motion control system. There are three elements. There's the combat, which is firing and grenade throwing and so on, pathfinding, and the animation control system. So that's the higher level. This feeds down into another... In between the motion control and the action, there is a level where, basically, we know what the goal is, and we need to find out exactly what kind of motion we need to do. The goal, the problem of motion is that it's a continuous problem. I could stand anywhere in this room, so how do I go about reasoning like that, given that we have a discrete processing unit available to us, the CPU? And the answer is that we discretize the problem by having the de designers place lots of points in the environment. Before you throw up your hands in horror, this is actually not the hardest part of creating a level in Halo. This is really simple, because these points have no context attached to them at all. All spatial analysis is performed by code. The designers do not place hints or anything. All they do is just place these points and then assign them in groups. You can see here a bunch of different groups. This is the way that the designers actually assign which area AI exists in at any given time. Is They specify a set of firing points which is attached to a given set of orders the AI has. And then when the AI wants to move somewhere, which is every so often um, distributed through time again, we need to examine all the firing points that are available to that AI and then weight them somehow. The weighting functions are all determined, they're all different depending on which kind of action you want. For example, if you're seeking cover, you want to find a point that doesn't have line of sight to your target. If you are fleeing, you want to find somewhere that's far away from your target. And if you're searching, you want to find somewhere that's near your target's last known location, so on and so forth. These are the different information that we compute for every given firing point. There's more than this, but these are the basic ones. Line of sight, distance, where the point is in relation to the situation, the friends and enemies, that sort of thing, and also the location of any vehicles, grenades, dangerous objects, that sort of thing. This senses the environment by casting rays, and this is expensive. This is the most expensive part of the AI in Halo. Typically, the calculation for casting rays through the environment is about 60% of all AI cost, and the rest is taken up just simply by pathfinding and perceptual bookkeeping. I'll give you a demonstration of this in just a bit. Uh, combat dialogue. 
The dialogue system is cool, but I don't really have time to spend on it. Um, all I'm going to do is just play a little line here. Oh, never mind. I guess we go to the demonstration right now. Uh, Jamie is going to switch the thing over to the Xbox. I'm going to show you some of the production tools that we use to debug the AI. No one outside Bungie has ever seen these tools running, and they're here on the Xbox for you today. All right. So let me just fly up here for a second. This is the area I was just showing you. Here it is. It's running in the game. Here are all the firing points in this area. I have selected an AI that's standing over here, and this is the current set of firing points they have available to them. Uh, the colors indicate what kinds of actions they can take at those firing points. Uh, not terribly important. But you'll see, as I run up here and I start engaging this AI, um, they will start to change their actions. What's been written about here is that the action pauses for just a second and fly away, you'll see that these AIs are undertaking different actions. These guys are fighting. Where's the other one? Oh, he's also fighting. And But these AIs over here have not yet seen the player because their individual knowledge does not indicate that they have heard anything yet. So now I'm going to just keep playing and you can see as this goes on, I'm going to fight my way through this encounter. You can see the actions change and also as I kill people, conditions will trigger and the set of firing points has now changed. So the AI is now retreating over there. They're still going through exactly the same set of actions they had before, which the points they have available from this change, and now it changes again. And I can do things like throw grenades at them and affect them in that regard. And if I, for example, come up here and kill this elite, you get a demonstration of the of the fleeing behavior. Uh, these guys just didn't flee because there's also another elite in the area, and they won't flee if they've got more elites around. So let me just come in here and kill all these guys. He has no, uh... Anyway. There's no run. Putting up a real fight. All right, so now I'm going to just quickly reset this and fly over to another area of the map. Many of you may be familiar with this particular encounter. This is one of the signature encounters in Halo, and this is actually the one we first used to build the AI system. This is where the Marines have just been dropped off by dropships, which in this case have been magically created because uh, I teleported there. And uh, I and the Marines are going to fight my way up the beach towards the Covenant positions here. And uh, I'm just going to do this one from the flying camera because it's much easier to see what's going on. So you can see these Marines are fighting their way up the beach here. And if I switch to another mode here... Let's keep going inside. Uh, all right, these are the individual targets that every character has. This is happening on the individual basis. These are the targets that each character has computed. Uh, and this is how the group coordination of the battle is taking place, is because every Marine is calculating stuff on an individual basis. If I select one of these Marines and then fly down here, these are the positions the, the Marines have available to them. And you can see these numbers above the firing positions. That's like, as every Marine computes which firing point he wants to go to, the numbers change based on the changing situation. And the one in yellow is there. You can see the Marines are all trying to get out of the way of the grenade there. Pretty successfully. We had a lot of problem with that in development. This character's not so successful. So uh, this is something interesting here. Let me pause this for a second. This is the knowledge web. Uh, every one of these lines represents an entry in the knowledge model between one character and the object that, that they do or don't know about. Yellow reflects the fact they do know about something. Blue reflects the fact that they have a previous acquired position from there. And uh, black means they don't know about it at all. So uh, uh, it's kind of hard to see. But if I fly down to this guy, you'll see that he only has about five lines coming out of him. And even though he's actually in an area where he could potentially be seeing about 20 characters. And that's because he's only got information about the guys that are interesting to him. So I'm going to let this play out over time. But as you see, like, it's all completely connected now because that elite up the top there is getting blown up at the moment. But uh, you see they've all got knowledge of this grunt who's currently flying through the air because they just saw him over the hill. But uh, as time goes on, you see now there's no knowledge about the environment because if I fly down here, you'll see that the Marines are actually climbing up the hill so they don't know where the Covenant is. So they've all gone into a searching state and some of them are crouching and crouch walking up the hill because they're searching for the Covenant. And you can see here's the past information they had about that one grunt who's now dead on the ground. And like here is all the past information they had about these other characters who have now moved back from the hill. As I let the simulation play out, the Marines will move up the hill and then I got you back. as they move up here, you'll see the knowledge model. It becomes pretty, pretty 
as everything starts coming down. And you can see there is a group of reinforcements back behind the rock there, and they have not been allowed to come out by the scripting yet. But they'll come out in just a second, and you'll see the knowledge model starting to, starting to become generated. It's just one way at the moment because they're hearing the Marines firing, but soon they'll start shooting, and then all the Marines start to know about them, and then there's a completely connected web built up. And then I'm just going to explain this in a second. This is the rays that are being cast any given second by the AI system. These rays are being cast for visibility purposes, and they're also being cast for uh, firing point evaluation purposes. So you can see on any given tick of the game update, which is 30 times a second, we can be casting quite a lot of rays, several hundred potentially. So as I let this advance, you see the rays are being cast. Those rays that are being cast back there are being cast towards me as the player. I'm back on the beach, and the AI is always seeing if they can see the player. The player has a little bit of special properties like that. And these marines will eventually advance up here. And then, that's it. That's all I was going to show on the demo there. So, yeah. uh, so I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, it looks like we've got about 30 seconds for questions. Um, does anybody have something that maybe a big hole that we missed that a lot of people would be interested in? Oh, sure. Uh, all right, I'll do that. Okay. Unless you'd like to. Uh, does anybody else have a question uh, related to our talk? Yeah. Uh, so the question was, do we rotate our playtesters? Uh, Microsoft has a database of thousands of playtesters, so we never let anybody play the same game more than once. Um, hey, mate, I don't again, think they're uh, going to give you a medal for that one. What's that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> nice. That was nice. Um, uh, you should go uh, check out the talk given by uh, our usability guys. Uh, it's got a lot more information in it. Anybody else? Yeah. How did you locate the firing point by manually or generate Yes, firing points are placed manually. We never had an uh, automatic generation. It doesn't really take very long. If you were to set up a complete encounter, which might have, say, 600 firing points in it, uh, the estimates I've got from our designers is that part probably only takes about half an hour, 45 minutes. Yeah, it's actually a lot of fun too. It's almost like sculpting. You get to kind of f get a feel for how the encounter is going to play out. The only problem is with the getting the feel for how an encounter is going to play out is you become very open to designer error. You know. <laughs> On that note, uh, I think we'll uh, we'll end. Uh, really? Thanks for coming.